on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. If you did your job and you focused on writing the best words that you can the first time, it's actually surprisingly amazing how, <laughs> how little time you spend editing and revising as you go. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It is The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson take your mind off global events let's talk about self-publishing the rise of the indie publishing world which is an exciting story and full of optimism generally if not a bit of a struggle a lot of the time as well we should say um, because we are battling marketing and selling and learning lots of new things and uh, I'm doing all of this and uh, we talked um, in the last few weeks about TikTok as a platform that's producing uh number ones in the uh, in the entire store and and making stars out of quite a lot of authors and uh, and i've taken to it great gusto um because i write historical fiction i sort of mentioned this last week i think there's a non-fiction element to historical fiction whether you're writing medieval or 1960s in my case or even you know, jane austen you've got people interested in the period so you could start doing stuff on that so i'm doing cold war aviation uh, following the advice of leela and jane who do the course which is just about to be released actually will be released by the time this podcast goes out uh, and they say find your wheelhouse stay in it um because i i have been tempted to take part in lots of other trends and stuff on tiktok but um i resist that and in the last few days i've passed several milestones i've had one million views on one of my posts i've had two million views in total and uh, i've crossed ten thousand followers and my book sales are three times what they were when i started uh with um with this venture so uh, i'm loving it i'm loving it as they say about mcdonald's not sponsored yeah well you've def definitely demonstrated We've answered one of the questions we see is it, it can only work for romance and subgenres of romance. It's quite clear, you know, you're, that's not your genre at all, and and you've done amazingly. And I've seen. I mean, I think world events are probably helping you a little bit um, in that people are possibly interested in yeah that kind of content, B fifty twos and everything. But it is um, yeah, it's, it's very impressive that what, that you've managed to do that. I mean, I'm hats off absolutely on that one. But if, yeah. you, if you can hear anything in the background here, my dog is just sitting mm. here and he's chewing a bone at the moment. Okay. So um, probably people will be hearing a, yeah. of a, a, a gnashing noise. <laughs> Nash of the dog. Uh, and scout the dog. Yeah. Um, yes, in fact, funny enough, because of world events which are worrying and serious, I have to tread a line with the way I, I present stuff because I'm interested in, in aviation and other people are, but it's, it's meaningless next to the human cost of mm -hmm. what's happening in Ukraine at the moment. I have to make that point. Of course, I do make that point. But at the same time, I also do want to talk about there was the world's largest aircraft apparently destroyed yesterday in, in Ukraine, so I did something on that. But the trouble with TikTok is it's a very... It's like any social media platform, but on steroids. So you think there's a short attention span on, on Facebook. Believe me, on TikTok, you look at the actual view time of your posts, even the ones that do really well, it can be a few seconds. And so people don't get through to the last part of it where I say uh, I am primarily interested, you know, concerned about the human cost of this. And this is irrelevant, but it's of interest. People don't get to that point. So then they comment and they say, you know people are dying don't you mm. and so yeah. you know you kind of get all that going as well but um you do need a bit of a thick skin i get a lot of personal comments as well which you know I kind right. of have to deal wow. with yeah uh not as bad i think as most women get uh, on those platforms but, yes um, yeah that's just well that's that's modern life these days isn't it? yeah but, you know, it is depressing so it's not for the faint of heart but uh it is something you need to um to explore if you're not already but you need to do it right so hopefully you're on our ad for authors program because that's what i've followed um uh, experts who tell you how not to make mistakes and what you should be doing to make this work okay right uh, we have a, a really good interview today but before then mark um uh, why don't we say hello to our new patreon supporters Yes, we've got two patron supporters to mention. So we've got Shyla Colt um, of No Address. And then if I scroll down, we've also got um, we've got a, a Christina uh, Huvel, also of No Address. So thank you to Shyla and Christina for supporting us on Patreon. Very much appreciated. 
Excellent. Now, if you want to join us live and in person this summer in London for the self-publishing show, the largest of its type on this side of the Atlantic, uh, you can go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash SPS live. That's self-publishing show live. That stands for SPS live. Uh, pick up your tickets if they're still available. Um, yeah, looking forward to that. I know you're working on the schedule, Mark. Can we reveal anything? Yeah, I mean, I've mentioned in the email I sent out last week, so people I've mentioned so far, uh, Joanna Penn, Nick Stevenson, um, Michael Andalay, um, who else? Uh, Caroline Peckham, Susan Valenti. Um, we've got, uh, who else have we got? I think Jasper Joffrey might be coming, coming back again. Um, Lucy. Lucy Score, yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, so there's, there's two people who have been up to number one in, in the... Uh, Kindle store in the last couple of months, uh, Lucy and, the, and uh, Suzanne and uh, Caroline. Also, a few more, I'm working on a few more as well. So we've got Stuart Bache will be there. We've got some ideas for, for covers that might be quite fun. Um, and a couple of others. Um, I still haven't necessarily found the one the person to close it yet. And I've got a couple of ideas on that. I suspect I'll, I'll end, end up doing something, but I won't, I won't do the closing keynote this time. I'll leave that to someone more qualified and more interesting than me. Um, I think we so, are expecting uh, you to be on stage at some point. I'll do something, but yeah, I think I might step back a little bit this year. Um, but we'll see. I'm, I'm not moving my mind up yet. I don't know what I talk about at the moment. We, um, we should say, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see this. I'm actually wearing the apparel for the conference. We have our own T-shirt mm. and hoodie. 2022 London. Uh, the self-publishing show. It's very comfy, actually. Very nice. We should have yellow and blue, really, shouldn't we? That'd be... Uh, yes, we should have yellow and blue. blue. Yes, we should. Yellow, well, there is blue, there is a yellow and blue. It's not quite the the uh, international Ukrainian yellow and blue, but it is a yellow ah, and blue one okay. available. But uh, yeah, um, okay. So yeah, hopefully tickets still available for you. Uh, they will, of course, sell out at some point. But selfpublishingformula.com forward slash sps live is the place to go for that. Okay. Um, I have uh, one more thing to say before we introduce Michael, which is to say that Michael Laron does write quite a lot of books to help other writers. Uh, you will find out in this interview that he is particularly expert at organization and finding time to write books, which is something I think a lot of us do struggle with. I'm up on a deadline. It's my last day today. I have to hand over my manuscript tomorrow, so I am deadline day uh, phonetically uh, myself at the moment. So where do you find the time? Well, Michael's very good at that, and he's actually put together... Uh, a PDF uh, for us to help. It's called 20 Secrets. So if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash 20 secrets to zero secrets, uh, you can get that for free. I think by the time you finish this interview, that is something you will want to read. Michael's super nice guy, really well organized. Uh, so let's hear it from Michael Laron. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Michael Laron, welcome to the Self Publishing Show. What a lovely uh, shot you've got there! It's all beautifully lit. It looks almost Christmassy, I'd say. Yeah, thank you. It, it took me a while to kind of get to this configuration. <laughs> I figured, yeah. figured you know, I got to have a nice background. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've got that, and I know it's important to you because not only are you uh, a writer with an established set of books we're going to talk about, but you also do a bit of craft instruction and uh, wit and wisdom for writers, uh, which we're hoping to pick up on in this interview today. So I know you take care of, uh, of appearances for communications. Well, thank you. I appreciate the kind words. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, look, let's start with you, Michael. Tell us a bit about yourself and your writing background. Yeah, I, 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 I'm one of those people that was always a writer in, in a sense, but I was never really serious about it until 2012. I was on a nice dinner with, with my wife and later that night I felt ill with what I thought was food poisoning. And it turned out to be a lot ser more serious than that. And I was in the hospital for a month. And up until that point, I'd kind of worked a, a dead end day job. It was a soul sucking job and I just hated every minute of it. And I, I remember being in a hospital bed and just kind of laying there doped up on morphine. And I, I had to ask myself, what am I doing with my life? And right around that time is when I found the creative pen. I learned about self-publishing and I kind of swore that I would become a writer and fulfill that dream. And so wrote my first book, started, uh, launched, launched it in 2014. 76 books later, here I am and got a YouTube channel and I do books for writers and I've done some courses and yeah, I'm just really, really enjoying everything, right? Science fiction, fantasy and, and self-help. 
So was that, was it the classic kind of near death experience that you had that made you think I've got to make the most of my life after this? Was that that type of revelation? Yeah, it, it was a near death experience. It, it wasn't a near death experience in the traditional sense of the term, but it was near death in the sense that if the doctors didn't figure out what was wrong with me in about a week or two, I probably would have been gone. Um, wow. Yeah, I, I, I will, I'll spare you the gastrointestinal details okay. that, uh, <laughs> that, I, that I had to go through. But uh, basically, there was an article in the USA Today that came out that it was like the week I got out of the hospital about this particular infection and how it was killing people my age across the country. And the doctors just had no clue. So wow. I was very lucky and I, I felt like I had a new lease on life. And I said, you know, you know what? I, I'm hopefully knock on wood. I'm never going to be this close <laughs> to having to deal with this again. So why don't I actually make something of my life and, and follow my dreams? Wow. Well, you certainly have done that. How many books did you say? 79? 76. Just 76. finished book 76 this morning, actually. And sci-fi, was this sci-fi and fantasy? Was this something you were reading? Or was it just sci-fi? Was it sci-fi and fantasy? Was this something you were reading before? Yeah, this was uh, urban fantasy. So I've, I've, uh, I, I, I've, kind of set up shop in urban fantasy moving forward. I, it's, it, I've written in a lot of genres and it's the genre that I really like the most. And so I, I'm, I'm writing a, it was book four in, in urban, urban fantasy series that I'm writing now. Yeah. So what is the appeal of urban fantasy, do you think? I don't say that dismissively. I'm genuinely interested in it. I think I, I think I know what it is, but I'd like to hear from somebody who enjoys it and reads it and writes it, what you think the appeal of urban fantasy is. Yeah, fantasy in the modern world. Fantasy that takes place in... In, in places that maybe you're familiar with or among people that could look like you or people that you know or people that are like the people that you know and there's this magical underbelly behind the scenes and i think that has a lot of appeal for a lot of people it is a very enticing concept isn't it that it could be out there it could be around us you just don't know about it which is goes back to the old witches i suppose and um uh, and lots of lots of stuff over history has had that real world scenario but just underneath if you just turn left of that molecule another world opens up it is enticing isn't it exactly you know you're walking through a dark alley maybe a vampire will pop out and make you immortal who knows yeah <laughs> or rip your head off you know, who knows yeah could go either way that one couldn't it um okay so so you've written you've gone through your sci-fi phase and you're into uh, an urban fantasy and this this amount of writing do you say t 2012 i think you had your your hospitalization yes yeah, so I mean, uh, I guess that's a few years, but that's still that's a prolific amount of writing. To talk to me about your writing process and your writing day. Yeah, my process has evolved over time, and 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 when I give this advice, I always like to be, I always like to give people something that they can take and and apply to their own situation. My, my first novel took me eighteen months to write, to write, edit, revise publish format, all that good stuff. My second novel took me four or my second novel took me nine months. So half that time, my third novel took me four to five months. <laughs> and now I'm to the point where I, I can probably, if, if I'm dedicated, I can sit down and write a novel in less than two weeks. Right. And my process today, my process today, it, it, it's definitely a refined process. So I am a extremely busy guy. Like I, I have built my writing career while raising a family um, working a full-time job in the insurance industry as an executive and attending law school classes in the evenings. And I think if there's anybody that ha should have an excuse not to write and not have 76 books, it's probably me. And th the things that I have learned to do over, over the years is number one, look for, look for time throughout the day that you can reclaim. So I'm a big fan of writing on my phone and I write with my thumbs. So I, I don't, you know, some people, they, they like to use the Bluetooth keyboards and all that stuff. I just use my thumbs and I've learned to pull out my phone in those times where I would probably be on my couch checking Facebook, you know, like just last week I was taking my daughter or I had to pick my daughter up from school and she, I forgot that she had this event after school. So I had 45 minutes to kill. So I pulled out my phone and I was using Scrivener and I just synced synced my manuscript to where I was on my desktop and I just picked up where I left off and I had like 1500 words to show for 45 minutes in my car. And that's kind of amazing. And I got home and we had a nice meal and I had a mountain of dishes in my sink. So I put my phone on my counter. 
I opened up the voice memo app and I dictated and I just spoke my story for about the 30 minutes that I was doing dishes, went downstairs, got it transcribed into dragon. And next thing I knew I had about a, a thousand more words and that's 2,500 words ish that I reclaimed throughout the day that I would not have had otherwise, because I was in that particular day. I think I was only in front of my writing computer, like 30 minutes. Wow. So, you know, that, that is like one of my secrets, you know, just look for that time that you can reclaim. And yes, it means maybe you spend a little bit less time on Facebook. Yes. It means maybe, you know, you're not going to be in your email as often, but you got words to show for it. And the math adds up and the math will be in your favor over the long term. Yeah. I mean, that's great, great advice. And you're absolutely right. It's just easy to pick out the phone and, and go on to TikTok is the latest obsession, although I'm using it for marketing, but nonetheless, it can absorb a lot of hours. Um, uh, inspirational as well, someone like me who does struggle to find the time to write that the time is is there, right? It's in front of us if you look for it. Although I don't know how my family would react if I was in the kitchen dictating whilst doing the washing up. Do they not feel this is odd behavior and come in and interrupt you? Oh, it's a hundred percent odd. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and they do interrupt me. And, and usually uh, my daughter, she's seven when I'm dictating at the sink, she's like, ah, daddy's dictating again. You know, what is he talking about this time? You know, but it's all good. It's all par for the course. I, I've got a very supportive family and, and I'm there when they need me. And so, you know, they kind of have to just put up with, uh, put up with dad saying weird stuff at the, at the dishes. <laughs> And you, you've got this, this job, you're still working full time in insurance. Yes. Uh, and you, yes. are you still doing the law degree? I just finished my law degree last year. Well so Congratulations. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank goodness. I'm glad to be done with it. And yeah, I'm still working full time and I somehow I've, I've been able to, to make it work. I've been very intentional about the jobs that I take and I try to find those jobs that give me the right amount of work-life balance and I've made it work and I've been very fortunate. Right. And is that, that's a deliberate choice commercially to, to keep all your sort of streams of income open or a lot of authors do look for that opportunity of saying, well, I'm no longer going to work for the man type thing. I'm going to work for myself. Is that something you aspire to or do you deliberately keep that sort of, what do they call it? A, um, a, a myriad or, or whatever they call it, a myriad of, of income streams, diverse as the word. I'm yeah. Keep, for. keep your options open. Yeah. I mean, definitely if, if I can swing for the fences, I'm going to do it. I'm not at a point where I'm able to yet, but certainly, you know, getting all my debts paid off and getting, getting the family in a position where, you know, we can afford going full time. That's definitely the dream and something I'd like to do sooner than later. I'm guessing a law degree is not cheap in America. No, it's not. But um, I, I was fortunate enough that my employer paid for most of it. I got a specialized law degree that wasn't quite as expensive and it allowed me to, to do some things that were, were helpful. Great. Uh, well, it's very impressive. And you run this yourself. So wh wh how many books are you producing a year now? It's somewhere between 10 and 15. Yeah. You know, if, if you do the math, I have, uh, I have a, a annual challenge. I call it my beast mode challenge. It's usually in the summer because that's usually when things are getting really nice outside. That's when a lot of writers stop writing. Dean Wesley Smith calls it the time of great forgetting. And I try to stop myself from falling into that. So I, I go into beast mode and I, for 90 days, I write as many books as I can. And so a lot of my books come from my Beastmo challenge. But usually I'm writing about a book a month, maybe every six weeks. And are you writing one book at a time or do you overlap? I write one book at a time just because I find that my energy, I, I, I can usually do a better job if I don't divide my focus. So I spend all my time focusing on that one book. And then when I'm done with it, I literally forget it. Like I don't even remember what's in my books anymore at this point. So I intense focus and then I'm done. Right. And, and do you are going to have the plotting uh, conversation now? I mean, because you have to move quite quickly. It sounds to me like you write an almost fully formed book, do you, the first, with the first draft? Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm a pantser or what you would call a pantser. I, I, I make it up as I go along and I have the time of my life doing it. It is a lot of fun. You like Marie Four, so you're constantly surprised what your characters do as you're writing the book. Always. Yeah, always. And, um, you know, I wrote a book, it's called the pocket guide to pantsing and it, it kind of goes through my, my process. I tried to write the most comprehensive book on this topic because I, I get a lot of questions about it. And I, I, I'm a big believer in, I just create the outline as I go. So what I do is I write a chapter and I figure out what happens in the chapter. And then when I get to the end of that chapter, I have an Excel sheet 
on my computer and I basically fill in what happened. So then when I write the next chapter, I can refer to that outline and remember what happened. So it's almost like you're, it's almost like you're outlining in reverse and, you know, I talk about this in the book, but I, I, I try to make that outline as detailed as possible. So then when I get to book two, I can, I can refer back to what I had and my, my notes were detailed enough to where I can remember, okay, yeah, my main characters, he was wearing a gabardine in that chapter and it got ripped. So I need to remember that. You know, he had to take that to the tailor, tailor or a tailor or dry cleaner or whatever to so, remember that. So help me keep things consistent. You'll do that for every chapter. You'll go into the spreadsheet and make a note of what you've just written. Every chapter, every chapter. And I take as I take as detailed notes as I can, because I will never remember the chapter as well as I do when I write it. Yeah, <laughs> so, of course. you know, you, you almost have one shot because otherwise, if you have to refer back to my 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 thing is, if I have to go back to the text and reread what I wrote, I probably screwed up. And that allows me to move faster through the manuscript. And then when I'm done, I go through everything one more time and I will read the text just to kind of shore up things that maybe were inconsistent between chapters. And it's worked really well for me so far. And so do you evolve a plotting process during, during the writing? So if you've written you know, 10 chapters at that point, it becomes clear to you how the structure of the rest of the book is going to work. Or are you still opening up your Word document, whatever it is, and being surprised by the next twist? I'm, I, I usually, I make myself refer to my outline because I, I find that my, my mind will wander like crazy and it's just very helpful for me to remember what came before. That's just a personal quirk. But that said, it, it's kind of funny. Like when I start a series, it's, it's weird. Like it's, it's almost eerie how the novels all have the same structure, like different stuff happens. But if you, if you read the stories, in most of my series, it's very familiar. There's a very familiar structure and it's very similar. One of my series, it always ends up being around 50,000 words. Like it's creepy. <laughs> so, you know, your subconscious has to be doing something right. I think at yeah. that point, you know, I, I must've internalized yeah. something to be able to do that without thinking about it. It's got a blueprint that's all ingrained in you. Um, and in terms of the, the stories themselves, then do you, you write in series uh, are, are these books that can be read standalone or do you, do you write books that basically are going to work one, two, three, four? I write books in, in sequential. So one, two, three, four, I probably could do a better job at making standalones. I, I feel like maybe I would have more, more marketing options if I did that, but that's just kind of the stories that come to me. I, I like, I like telling a story of a character, you know, taking them from the beginning and taking them through an arc throughout the series and, and figuring out where they end up. There's just something that's always appealed to me about that. Yeah. And so uh, I mentioned Word and Scrivener. So I mean, do you have a, a you use your phone, obviously, I think it's, do you say, do you use Scrivener? Yes, I use Scrivener. So I, I'm, I'm kind of a writing app junkie. So I, I have tried just about every major writing app on the market in terms of demoing it, because I have a YouTube channel, it's called Author Level Up. And that's what I do is I do writing app tutorials and writing app videos. So, but I always keep coming back to Scrivener just because it, it's, it's what I know. And I like the, the ability to kind of sync between my phone and my desktop. But for some of my nonfiction up until recently, I was using Ulysses, which is a, a markdown writing app. And I like Ulysses just because it's a simpler writing experience as well. So for a long time, I was, I was writing fiction in Scrivener and then I was writing my nonfiction in Ulysses. Right. So um, let's talk about your nonfiction. Uh, you you write guides to writing, but is there a particular aspect of that that you've picked up on that you feel you um, can talk to people about? Yeah, I, I, I like to write business books for authors. I write some craft stuff. So I have my, 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 my most popular book is called Be a Writing Machine. And that is how to write smarter, faster, beat writer's block and be prolific. That's kind of in my wheelhouse. But I also write books that I, tr I try to write things up, up that other people don't touch. Right. So I just wrote a book on estate planning for authors. Oh, <laughs> which, you yeah. know, you, you think about that. It's like, oh, that's the most boring topic ever. But it's an important topic. And so I just try to pursue the topics that I that I want to learn about myself. So I, I write about, uh, I wrote about this book about estate planning. I've written books on dictation for authors. I wrote this book on pantsing, you know, pocket guide to pantsing. So I, I just try to try to fill in gaps where maybe there's not as much content 
for people to consume. And then what I do is I go as nitty gritty as possible. Um, my community always says that I have, I have a nitty gritty personality. I, I take a topic and I just dissect it until there's nothing left. So nerdy type thing, which is not, you know, it's, it's no longer an insult. It's now the coolest thing to be a nerd. Oh yeah. Yeah. The nerds always win in the end. Yeah, they do. Exactly. Have done for some time. Um, and how, how do you organize that? So you write books on the nonfiction side on craft and marketing, as you say, and you have, uh, uh, you know, what you talked about your community, where is your community? Yeah. My community is primarily on author level up.com or youtube.com slash author level up. I've got a great community of, of over 40,000 subscribers and I do live streams where I, I provide some time every, the first week, first Saturday of every month, I actually come online and we just write and I invite as many people to come, come on board and we just write as a community. And it's a space for people to gather and people can ask me any questions they have about craft or business. And I also have a daily blog where I talk about all the things that I'm doing every day to further my writing business. So I'll say, okay, I wrote 2000 words today and I was on uh, the self-publishing show, <laughs> you know, and uh, I also, I managed to finish a novel this morning and I just talk about what I'm doing. And my community really likes that because they can kind of see behind the curtains and they can see, okay, this is how he's spending his time. This is how he's doing things. Maybe I can learn from that. And it's been, been fun. What was your life like before 2012? Did you work in this structured and prolific way? I was a pretty disciplined guy. I, I, my introduction to art was through music. So I grew up playing the saxophone, guitar, tuba, keyboards, and I wanted to be a music composer. So I had a lot of discipline. I was sitting down and writing songs almost every week. So I had a very disciplined approach to things, but music, I realized just wasn't ever going to be for me. And so when I got to college and started doing some of the writing, I was just, I, I think you could say I was disciplined, but I was aimless. I just didn't know what it was that my calling was, you know? And so I was exploring a lot of things and I just... I, I just didn't have the focus that I have now. Yeah, I suppose it's it's that difference, working hard and working smart, but you seem to do both. I try, I try. I, I can't always can't always promise that that's what I'm doing, but I, I try to focus on the things that are the most important. You know, I have three goals in my writing business. The first is how do I become a world-class content creator? Meaning how do I create the content that is the best content that I can create? How do I become a technology and data driven writer? Meaning how can I use technology to get the right books in front of the right readers at the right time and to improve the reading experience. And then also to give me insights into the writing business and where my sales are coming from and learning more about my readers. And then also how to become the writer of the future, right? So what, where's the, where's the puck going? What are the, what are the technologies and things that I need to be paying attention to? And I almost exclusively focus on those things, everything else. I mean, I, I do marketing of course, but um, I focus primarily on those three things and that allows me to, to be laser focused. Do you worry about burnout, Michael? No, I don't. I don't. I probably should have been worried about burnout about three years ago because <laughs> I was doing way more than I'm doing now. I, uh, like way more. I mean, just the stuff that I explained to you that I was doing more than that. And it was getting to a point where I, I had to say, okay, I need to take a step back from things. But I'm at a point now where I feel like I've kind of come through that. And my, my thing is I have fun. Like I love being on these shows and talking to, to interviewers like you. I love sitting down and telling a story and I just have the time of my life doing it. And maybe one day that won't be the case, but as long as that's the case, that always keeps me going. And if you have the passion, you have the fun when you're, when you're writing stories and, and doing this stuff, then you wake up seven, eight years down the road and you've got a ton of books to your name and you're kind of surprised. <laughs> it's like, yeah. how, how did this happen? You know, it's the old John Lennon quote, isn't it? About never doing a day's work in your life if you enjoy what you do. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's just talk about marketing then. So what, what marketing strategy do you have for your huge amount of books, your massive canon. Yeah. It's, it's actually amazing how little time I spend marketing. Um, my, my biggest focus with marketing is ads. Right. So, uh, I, Amazon ads, I've used those and, and have made a lot of money on Amazon ads and just 
been very profitable with that. Um, also, my YouTube channel is another area that is a constant source of leads for me in terms of speaking opportunities, in terms of selling books. You know, there, there are videos that I can make or that I made on YouTube that people are still watching that I made seven, eight years ago you know, and, and they're racking up tons of views. So that's always a really good opportunity for me. And then also just connecting with people, connecting with other authors in my genres and, and chatting with people. I find that that that's, that's a good marketing strategy as well. Yeah. Is it Amazon ads over Facebook ads for you? Yeah. Amazon ads over Facebook. I, you know, I have a goal this year to, to get into Facebook ads. I just, I, I worry with my mental capacity that I will start crossing some signals <laughs> when it comes to comparing the data. Uh, Cause I like to spend a lot of time deep diving into the, the ad data just to really see if I can learn trends and things. And I just worry that doing two might be a bit much for me, but I, I at some point I have to get into it. Yeah. I mean, they're very different platforms, which is helpful in that sense. And I, I do do both and it never feels to me when I'm on one platform that I'm, I'm confusing it with the other because they're so different. Frustratingly okay. so actually, but anyway, um, Good yeah, job. I'm just trying to think people like Shane Silvers, I think who's a, obviously a big author in the urban fantasy world. I think he is definitely has a lot of success with Facebook ads. I imagine that would be a fertile territory for you, but I hate to add to your workload, Michael, because I'm concerned. Oh, about it's you. okay. It's okay. I mean, that's, that's all, it's all part of the game. You got to keep, keep trying and, you know, keep trying new things that work and, you know, newsletter marketing has worked well for me. Autoresponders have been something that have worked extremely well. I kind of treat them like little salespeople. <laughs> yes. That's what I like to call them. You know, I've got autoresponders that I wrote five years ago and people respond to them every time. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's as if I wrote it yesterday. I mean, I have one autoresponder where um, I, I talk about my approach to copyright, my approach to productivity and production schedules and, and all that. And I always invite people to reply at the end of that, because I, I give them this riddle and I say, you know, I'm going to have, I'm going to have 3000 copyrighted works at the end of three years. I've only got 76 books. If you want to know the answer, reply, and I'll tell you how I got there. <laughs> and people are always intrigued by that. So, you know, autoresponders and newsletter marketing, um, it's, it's an author's best friend. Engagement. Yeah, very good. Absolutely. Um, and your day then, your working, I mean, I know you, you, you finished your law degree, which is one thing, but your working day, I, I'm still intrigued by the, the level of stuff you've got going on, the balls in the air here, the marketing uh, the auto I mean, the auto response, I guess, look after themselves, but the writing, what does your day look like? Do you get up super early? Do you go to bed super late? And how, where, in addition to sitting in the car on those moments, where do you find that time? Yeah, the answer is yes. And so I, I get up very early. I get up about five 30 in the morning. And that is what I've found when you have a young family, it's one of the best times to wake up because everyone's asleep. And it's one of the only times a day you're not going to get interrupted constantly. So I'm usually up about five 30, usually hit my writing computer about six. And depending on what my goals for the day are, I'm always asking myself, what is the, what is the one thing I can do that will result in victory today? You know, even if it's one thing I can do, what's the one thing I can do that will make this day a success. Sometimes that's writing, you know, two or 3000 words. Sometimes it's doing some marketing. Sometimes it's clearing out my email inbox, but I'm usually doing some level of work or productivity until about seven 30 when it's time for me to log into work. And fortunately I, I, I work from home, so I don't have to commute. And uh, when I'm at work, I'm at work. You know, occasionally I'll have a break and I'll be able to pull out my phone and get some work in, get some words in, I should say. And then when I'm off work, I usually pick my daughter up from school, spend family time. And then as we're winding down about 8.39 ish, that's when I'll get back to my writing computer. And I will try to get some more words in for that day or fit finish my goals whatever those are and then i'd like to say i'm in bed by 10 o'clock but i'm usually not in bed by 10 o'clock <laughs> i'm usually in bed some sometime between 10 30 and 11 30 and then i wake up and do it again wow so okay well let's talk about um uh, pantsing a little bit uh and plotting it's a it's a subject that um we do talk about from time to time and it seems to me that a lot of authors simply write in the way that they write. So they say, oh, I'm, I have to plot or I have to pants, but they very often haven't really tried the other one. Do you see pantsing? We could call it discovery writing as a slightly nicer term than pantsing. Um, do you see pantsing as, as the more efficient way of getting books out? I think it can be. I think you have to, you have to do it a certain way for it to be more efficient. 
because if you it's it, it both there's no there's no right or wrong way to write a novel like I, I want people to understand that if you if you're an outliner and and you feel that that's what makes you produce novels that you feel proud of that's fine i think both can be used for good and evil so if you are a pantser and you're just blazing through the manuscript to get a first draft and then you have to go back and fix everything or deeply revise everything i, I think you kind of miss the point uh, because you're you're not it's it's really not efficient at that point because then you've got to go back and fix everything and if you've been relying on the discovery part of the writing to get the manuscript down if you go back and change everything or restructure things then you know i don't know that you really got the discovery benefit out of the method so the way i have learned to make pantsing more efficient is one outlining as i go as i talked about and you know i, I learned a lot of this from dean wesley smith in his book writing into the dark i just kind of took it and 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 modified it for my purposes so outlining as i go because that makes me more efficient and then what i do is i i loop back so what i it's a little trick that i've learned is when i finish a chapter i will go back to like say i, I write chapter one and then i write chapter two and then i write chapter three four and five when i get to the end of five I will go back to chapter one and reread what I wrote. And then another thing I will do is I will go back to chapter one in the previous book, and then I will reread what I wrote. And it's amazing what you catch. So then I'll, I'll, when I finish chapter one, I'll go back to five and I'll go forward. And I just keep going back and back, back and backward and forward, backward and forward. And it only takes a few minutes to review what you wrote. Like, it's not like you got to spend tons of time because if you did, if you did, if you did your job and you focused on writing the best words that you can the first time, it's actually surprisingly amazing how, <laughs> how little time you spend, you know, editing and revising as you go. So when I get to the end of the book, then what I can do is all I have to do is just make a, a little pass through everything. And it makes it, it just makes it so much easier and so much more efficient because then I'm documenting what happened in the book as I write it. And I know that what I wrote, is good and it's consistent and it just makes everything more efficient. When What's the purpose of going back to the previous book and reading chapter one? I like to do that because it's amazing what details you can miss. So like you think, like you think a character's eyes were a certain color or you think right. a character did something a certain way and it turns out maybe they didn't do it that way. They did it another way. And I know it sounds simple and it sounds like, Oh, well, why would you do that? But, you know, your mind will play tricks on you, especially as series get longer. You know, you, you have to come up with some sort of way to keep those details consistent. Like, for example, I had I have a character in this series I'm writing right now. It's called The Good Necromancer. I have a, a character who he kind of this character is it's, it's a supporting character. He kind of shows up in every book, but he shows up in a different way. And so every time he shows up, I have to remember how he showed up the last time, <laughs> because if I don't, then it's inconsistent. And the readers will say, wait a minute. No, he, he, he wasn't, he didn't do that the last time. So it, it keeps your character details consistent, especially if you are writing, if you're taking time between books, right? Like if you write all your series at the same time, it's a lot easier to keep those details consistent. But you know, if you take, if you write book one and then you take three months off, you're going to forget stuff that happened. It, it's just it's, it's the things you learn over the years when you when you write a lot of books it's like a a little hack that that works i mean i find i've forgot, forgotten stuff during the during the same book exactly yeah, you that's started, a, it's 100 yeah. correct <laughs> I, I mean i i have a a slightly more basic system i have a word document and every now and again when i invent a new character there needs to be another guy in the room so i just go in there and i always put a timeline i i work back to their date of birth and and mm -hmm. have their their key points there, and then I have to refer to that. But so uh, yeah, there's different different ways of doing that. But uh, I know some bigger authors. I think Mark has somebody. He's recruited a reader at some point, an avid reader who does that. Effectively keeps his Bible for him about uh, everything that's happened to John Milton because he's forgotten. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a it's an interesting problem to have the longer you do it, especially when you have a long series. And so I I think a lot of people listening, you know, just have to find their own way to do it. And just try to figure out how other people do it, you know, because not everybody talks about it publicly. Yeah, no. And do you, um, your series, how long are your series? I mean, how many different series have you got in those 76 books? I've got, for fiction, I, I've written about 34, 35 novels. 
and it's across, I think, eight or 10 series. And I kind of experiment. I mean, my series are definitely no longer, no shorter than three books. I, I've written a nine book series and I made some interesting mistakes with that series that I learned a lot from. I wrote nine books without really understanding. Real, I, I, I messed up the, I messed up book one in terms of the market piece and target reader. So I went on and wrote nine books and the series really didn't do very well, <laughs> but uh, I learned from that. And so most of my books now are anywhere between three and five. And if they're really popular, then I'll keep going. I'll keep them going. Yeah. So you, ha over half your books are nonfiction or 35. Yeah, but, yeah. It's about, it's a, well, it's about, yeah, half, a little bit, half, half nonfiction fiction. Okay. Okay, so um, you're prolific in that area as well, yeah. Okay, yeah. And, and I think you've got a giveaway for us, uh, Michael. I think you're kindly going to give us your craft playbook, number one. Just tell us a bit about that, and then we can give a link. Yeah, it's the Writing Craft Playbook. I, I wrote a book. It's a free book that I, I give away, and it's 20 secrets uh, for fiction and nonfiction to help get your readers in the zone. So one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing is studying the mega bestsellers. So the Michael Crichton's, the John Grisham's, the Dean Koontz, Nora Roberts, you know, all of those writers. And I pay very close attention to how they execute certain things from a craft perspective. And I started to notice a lot of commonalities between a lot of the mega bestsellers. And I, I thought, huh, this is an interesting little book I could write. And so the book is a bunch of illustrations using text of, of the different techniques that the mega bestsellers use to open and end their chapters. And if you look at those, you can start to see, okay, this is how, this is how maybe a, a mega bestseller would do it. Maybe am, am I doing it this way? And you can start to learn some of those tricks because uh, no one, no one, no one writes better fiction than those mega bestsellers. No. And so they're doing a lot of things, right. And if we can learn from them, then we can, we can exponentially improve our craft. Excellent. Okay, well, let's set up that at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash 20 secrets. Seems like a good uh, uh, link. 220 secrets, 20 secrets uh, to get that book. I'm going to read that book. because That sounds like uh, an excellent thing to do. Very similar to what Susie K. Quinn has done, where she basically wrote a book that didn't, you know, expected like you always do with your first book, that you're going to be picking up, picking up the Pulitzer Prize very shortly. I was disappointed it wasn't a mega hit and yeah. then started looking <laughs> at the books that were mega hits and thinking, oh, they're not written in, in what I thought uh, I was writing. So, yeah, studying the uh, studying the winners. Michael, I, I mean, I feel I've got to let you go at some point because uh, you've got goals for the day and you're a, a driven and um, organized man. And I'm in awe of that and what you've achieved and what you're going to achieve. It's uh, it's incredible. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be here. And uh, so pleased you, you went, uh, so pleased, I'm disappointed for you, you went through that episode in 2012. I'm so pleased you come out of it with such positivity that we can feed off as well. Thank you very much for being on the show, Michael. Thanks, James. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. My thanks to Michael uh, for joining us. Uh, we had a few technicals in trying to get that interview sorted out. He was very patient. And uh, yeah, really lovely chap. Very hardworking, uh, quite inspirational in that sense. And uh, I'll give the uh, the link again for the giveaway, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash 20 secrets, two zero secrets to get that giveaway from Michael. Uh, yeah, so Michael uh, in that interview talked about finding those little pockets of time, Mark, like 15 minutes, 20 minutes in his car, writing on his phone or dictating and transcribing it later. Um, do you have to do that? I mean, you have a busy life. You've got young children. Do you find yourself finding little snatched moments or do you manage to sort of get away into your little office here? No, I, I don't. Um, I, I kind of have a setup that I kind of need to be in front of in order to be able to write. So I, I, I have three screens, I pointed one, two, three, um, for research. And, you know, and I have a, I just have a kind of way of doing things. I I find it difficult to write these days on a, on a laptop keyboard. So I have a kind of a, 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 a full size keyboard, mouse, uh, all that kind of stuff. So I just kind of, I'm, I mean, I'm set in my ways now when it comes to how I actually write physically. Um, and I just make sure that I, that, you know, I'll, I'll do, that'll be the first thing that I do each day is, is to get an hour or two in. Hopefully more, but depends on what, what else is going on as to whether I can do that. But that, that's, I just kind of prioritize the writing. Yeah. Yeah. Morning's my time as well for this. Right. I think that is it, Mark. Just a reminder, uh, if you want to come to the show, I hate you to miss out. But if you want to come, you need to snap your ticket up. Uh, the self-publishing 
show live in London 2022 in June. It's going to be uh, tickets available at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash SPS live. And I think that is it, Marcus. I'll uh, let you go back. You've got your internet back since the big great storm of 2022. Yes, I was without internet for a week at home, so that was lots of me kind of patching my laptop to my, using a hotspot on my phone to get on that way, or going into the office, which I still have. But I was thinking once the uh, the new office is coming on, it'll be finished in about a month's time. And um, that would have, if I didn't have the office in Salisbury, I would have been, um, this is a very first world problem, but I would have had uh, very patchy internet for, well, for a week. You need to subscribe to Starlink. I probably do. Yeah, exactly. That would be a, Elon Musk a, good, uh, a good backup. Yeah. But no, we're, um, we're, we're back up and running again now. Good. Okay. All right. Thank you very much indeed to our guest, Michael Leron. Thank you to the team behind the scenes who put this podcast together, without whom you wouldn't be seeing us or listening to us. And thank you very much indeed for listening. Uh, that's it. All that remains for me to say is a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with the self-publishing show. <laughs>